So the bell has rung. The bell has rung, so I guess it's time to start. Um, uh, this session is called The Professional Economist. And um, it's, I really don't want to do it so much as a formal lecture like most of the others, but more as an informal discussion um, between all of us about um, you know, sort of what it's like to be an economist for a living uh, or what it's like to be some kind of professional, intellectual, academic, activist, whatever. Um, you know, you're all here this week because you like, you know, you're interested in this stuff that we're all doing and that we're all talking about. But many of you are here also because you have an interest in doing this professionally for a living. Either, you know, being a professor or being some kind of a writer or a journalist or working at a, a think tank or a policy organization, um, being a, a, a high school teacher or whatever. But you're interested in the ideas, you're interested in Austrian economics and sort of the ideas of liberty, um, and you want to um, do something uh, to make a difference. Uh, so this is really, you know, a session about sort of what, what I want to do when I grow up um, and how you can go about doing something valuable. Um, along these lines. Now, I'm going to talk mostly about economics because that's what I know the best and that's sort of the foundation of what we're doing. But I hope that most of our discussion will be in sufficiently general terms that it'll, it'll, it'll apply to you no matter what your specific discipline may be, if it's something other than economics uh, or whether it's um, uh, 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 or whether your career, whether you're at a slightly different stage in your career um, or whatever. So if if any of the discussion seems not relevant enough to your case, let's just speak up and let's try to bring it around. So I, basically the format is I'm going to make some introductory remarks and then really just turn it over for questions and discussions and we can all kind of bounce ideas off of each other. Um, this session evolved out of something that we used to do a long time ago. I think um, Lou mentioned that this was the 16th Mises University. And I remember back in Mises University 1 and 2 and 3, um, a bunch of us who were grad students at the time began, we would just sort of sit around and, and mostly gripe about, you know, how horrible graduate school was and how, how badly we were treated by the professors and so on. And you know, how, how can sort of Austrian interested graduate students stick together and help each other and learn from each other? And then it kind of it, it morphed into an actual session and then it became sort of a, a lecture. And here it is like a real like a real lecture, but, but it's really not. Um, anyway, so I'm going to talk about, like I said, I'm going to talk about economics mostly because that's what I know and because there are a lot of interesting things associated with being an economist for a living. And you can actually be an economist uh, 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 as, and, and make money doing it. Um, typically not a lot of money, but, um, uh, you know, a lot of economists are employed at universities and colleges as professors. Um, a lot of professional economists work in, uh, uh, work for policy organizations, think tanks, some work in government organizations, the Federal Reserve, and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm really talking more about sort of academic or policy-oriented economists, not the guys you see on CNBC, you know, chief economists for Solomon Smith Barney or something. These are sort of basically applied forecasters, and they don't, there's not a lot of economics, certainly not economic theory, um, or even economic history behind what they do. So, you know, I don't have anything to say about how you get to be a talking head on CNBC. Um, so I'm really talking more about um, people who are interested in economics, the, the, the subject and, and its applications. Um, so again, you, some of you are probably economics majors and uh, as undergraduates or maybe graduate students or thinking about being graduate students or, or, or even beyond. Um, but others of you might be interested in political science or history or uh, who knows. We've had people in all disciplines from psychology to literature to Everything under the sun, and 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 and, and that's uh, that's great. Part of our discussion will be oriented towards people who are interested in an academic career. So what it, you know, issues specifically related to getting a doctorate, a PhD in economics or some other field, which raises some other interesting career, uh, career whoops, career concerns, which I think are well uh, captured by this cartoon. That's always been one of my favorites. <laughs> So there are some career trade-offs to be considered, um, you know, relative to becoming a successful attorney or a successful manager or entrepreneur, uh, you, you're not going to get really, really wealthy uh, doing this. And sometimes it's hard to get an academic job. The academic job market is widely distorted by government intervention, which often means subsidies. There are probably more 
professors than there would be in a truly free market for higher education, um, which of course is good if you want to be a professor. <laughs> we're all against subsidies, you know, except when we are personally the re- recipients of the subsidy. And of course, we're still against them. But, um, <laughs> but I guess sort of the main point that I want to make, sort of main general point uh, today is that, you know, whatever your career goals might be, whatever it is you want to do, um, things don't just sort of happen um, in this business. I mean, you have to make them happen. You have to think strategically about how to, how to have a career in whatever it is you want to do. Um, so if you want to be a, an economics professor, you know, at, at a research university, let's say, um, you know, there's a series of steps you have to go through to get to be in that position. And you need to learn what those steps are, understand what you need to do at each stage, do some long-range planning. Um, you know, a, a lot of us, because you know, all of us here are interested in, in truth and justice and making the world a better place, but sometimes we tend to be a little bit naive about that. And we had a discussion at, at one of the seminars a couple of nights ago. Someone asked the question, you know, why doesn't the truth always win out in the marketplace for ideas? And we had some really interesting discussion, you know, talking about institutional factors and psychological factors that might affect that. But the same is true for being a professional intellectual, a free market intellectual. Um, You know, some of us have the rather naive idea that, well, I'm just going to go out there and pursue truth and let the chips fall where they may. Okay? And I'm not here to tell you that that is necessarily the wrong strategy, but anyone who pursues that strategy should be aware of all the costs, the trade-offs that are involved, and to know that it doesn't always work that way. Okay? And it's okay. Indeed, I would encourage you at least to think about sort of strategic issues. How can I plan to be where I want to be in the academic or intellectual um, enterprise? Let me just give you an example. And here's one that has to do with um, uh, being a professor. Uh, yeah, you can see the whole thing. You know, for, for, just for example, suppose that your goal was to be you know, a professor with tenure at, let's say, a research university, a major, you know, Auburn University or something. Um, Well, you don't just wake up one day and be a tenured professor at a university like Auburn. There's a whole series of steps you got to go through, right? Before you're a tenured professor, you have to be an untenured or assistant professor. Before you can be hired as an assistant professor and get promoted to full professor or tenured professor, you know, you have to uh, get a Ph.D. in economics. Um, Before you can get your Ph.D., you have to be a Ph.D. candidate where you've taken all these courses and passed all these exams. And then, you know, uh, before you can do that, you've got to be in grad school, so you've got to get admitted to grad school and so on. So, you know, if suppose you're right here today and you want to be down there, you've got to figure out the steps, right? So figure out what diagram applies to, applies to your case, where you are today and where you want to be, and what are the intermediate steps. Now, uh, you know, there are certain things you have to do at each stage to move from one step to the other. You know, and in this case, you got to, you know, get your college degree and you got to get into graduate school. That's a whole big issue right there. Where do I want to go to grad school? What criteria should I use in trying to select a program and what individuals I want to study with? And what do I put on my application? What do I, how do I, you know, what test, standardized test scores do I need to have? Blah, 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 blah. So then you finally get in grad school and you think, whew, you know, the hard work's over now. But, of course, the hard work's just beginning and you got to take all these classes and pass all these exams and then you got to be advanced to to candidacy, you got to become a PhD candidate, and okay, whew. I, I remember when I when I was at that stage myself, and I passed my last comprehensive exam, and I thought I was in I was in heaven because I would never take another test again, um, you know, except a driver's license test or whatever. No more exams, and I thought I had it made, but actually it got much harder after that point. You know, so you have to write a dissertation. How do you do that? Well, first you got to have a dissertation topic, and you have a dis- have to have a dissertation committee. And you have to learn how to do the kind of research that one does to complete a dissertation. Uh, you know, then you've got to finish the, the darn thing. You get your Ph.D. Then you have to try to get a job as a professor. How do you do that? Um, actually, the, the, the job market for academic positions is very, it's very organized. And everything works in a systematic way according to certain predefined rules. And if you don't know what those rules are, you're, you're lost. Um, it, and this, this is a relatively recent phenomenon. Even, even a generation or two ago, if you talk to the really old guys around here, you know, like Salerno and Garrison, guys like that, you know, it, there was a time even 20 years ago when to get a job as a professor, 
you know, some people would make a few phone calls on your behalf. Your major professor would call a colleague in another school and say, hire my student. You'd get a job, and that's it. It doesn't work that way now. There are, you know, literally hundreds and sometimes thousands of people competing for a narrow set of jobs. And everything, there are certain milestones, and you have to go to certain meetings and send your resume to certain places. And if you don't know how to play that game, you're almost certainly not going to get a job. Um, as a professor, right? And so you do that, and then, well, what do I do to get promoted, to get tenure? Well, I have to satisfy certain requirements, publish papers, teach classes, perform, serve, you know, who knows? But um, anyway, th- just think of this as a template. That, and, and as we go, we can talk about how you would fill in the template in your specific case. Um, but it's just really sort of the, the learning this mode of thinking is, is, is really what I'm interested in sort of getting across. Now, Next question is, well, okay, so, you know, I know where I am now and I know where I want to be in 10 years or whatever. How do I, how do I fill this thing out? I mean, how do I learn what the steps are and how do I learn what the requirements are to advance at each step? Well, you have to, this is where you have to do some research. Nobody's going to, going to just tell you everything you need to know. Um, you have to talk to people, right? One, one good way to do it is to find someone who's here, okay, and say, how did you do it? And if they did it a long time ago, you need to find out, well, how might, how might things have changed since then? But, you know, that's one great thing about this week for a lot of you is that, um, you know, a lot of the faculty and, and even your fellow Mises University students, some of them might already be at the place where you want to be. And so this is a chance to pick their brains. Um, you can read about it a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff that's written in, in specialized publications, you know, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Places like that where you can learn all these steps. A lot of universities have a website where they list their requirements for, you know, for hiring and promotion. Um, so you have to read, you have to do research, you have to talk to people, you have to compare notes with your friends, um, and, and, and just learn. You've got to figure this stuff out, okay? So that should be your goal is to try to be able to map out a, a route like this, okay? Um, one very important thing that all of you I, I, I'm sure that most of you have, have already heard this and thought about this. Is that, you know, there are certain trade-offs, right? The, the academic establishment, much like the think tank establishment, policy world, law schools, and so on, you know, I don't want to shock anybody, but they're not dominated by Austrian free market libertarian scholars, okay? So very few... Uh, Austrian economists or libertarian legal theorists or political theorists or whatever are occupying chairs at Harvard, Princeton, and MIT. Um, and th- there are some exceptions to that. But generally speaking, um, a lot of the stuff that we do here is a little bit out of the fashionable mainstream, okay, which means it might be more difficult for you to go through all these steps than it would be for you know, your, 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 your uh, socialist, interventionist, uh, you know, whatever-ist friend. Okay, does that mean you shouldn't do it? Well, of course not, but, I, I, but you shouldn't be naive about it, right? Don't go in to this profession thinking, I'm going to write a dissertation on, you know, Rothbard's analysis of X, and I'm going to get a job at Harvard. It ain't going to happen, okay? So if, you know, if you will never be satisfied as a human being on this planet unless you are a tenured professor at Harvard, you need to pick another field, okay? You need to do something else. Just be aware that there are some limits. And we can talk about the details of that, too, if you want. And, and I don't want this to sound like whining or, you know, sort of sour grapes. And, oh, we poor Austrians. Nobody likes us. It's not fair. Um, but, I mean, you just have to be realistic about look at, look at the reality of the profession that you're interested in and find out if being, you know, one of these weirdos who hangs out at Mises University is going to hurt you or stigmatize you. I mean, that raises another set of issues, which we can talk about as well, is, Okay, given that reality, what do you do? Do you, do you sort of hide it and, you know, hope that nobody will notice? And then one day you'll sort of burst out and you'll jump out of the closet and reveal yourself. Um, <laughs> or do you just, you know, lay it all out on the line from day one and, and you let those professors know in the first day of class that you think they're idiots? Um, that strategy can have some drawbacks, too. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, but, but So think, of, think like an economist in terms of evaluating these trade-offs. Think about your own life goals and how you value different things and whether you're willing to live a life of genteel poverty. Um, you know, be honest about your abilities and your interests. Okay? I mean, you know, you, there may be, what's, what's really your first goal over here? You might think about it and say, well, I've done the research. I've, I've learned what it takes to get here. 
whatever, whatever here might be. And I realize that I have to work 80 hour weeks. I can't, you know, have a family or if I have a family, I can't spend any time with them. You know, I can't really do Austrian economics. I can't do this. I can't do that. Or I'm just not capable of doing that. I just, I don't, have, you know, I, I know that I could not be Murray Rothbard. Okay, I, I cannot achieve what he achieved in his lifetime, the volume and the quality of his scholarly output, because I ain't that smart. Okay, um, So I, it would be foolish for me to pursue that strategy, because I know that's just not something that's, as a you know, modern economist might say, that's not within the feasible set for Peter Klein. Okay, so you need to think about what's feasible for you. Um, and you need to ask around a lot. Ask for advice. Don't be shy about talking to other people and asking them to evaluate you and give you suggestions on what you can do differently and what they think might be uh, you might be able to do. Okay, okay, that's sort of the that's kind of the general overview. Let me just throw out a few scattered comments that I've jotted down, and then we'll just have open discussion. Let's sort of throw it open for questions and comments. Okay, um, one point is um, I think it's important when you think about academic career goals to think in terms of standard academic disciplines, right? So if you're interested in economics, your goal should be, I want to be an economist. Don't say, I want to be an Austrian. Okay, I mean, you know, Mises, Hayek, Rothbard, they never considered themselves Austrians first. That's not how they identified themselves. They were economists. They were interested in economics. Now, they happened to believe that one particular approach to doing economics was the right one, but they were interested in economics more broadly. Now, I have to say this. Uh, I have to say that in, in recent years, um, there have been some people who have been attracted to Austrian economics, some aspects of Austrian economics, but not, at the end of the day, really been very interested in economics, not interested in the economy, how the economy works, you know, real features of the economy. The people who picked up on one little snippet that was in some article of Mises or Hayek and sort of ran with it. Um, it's very difficult to, to, to accomplish anything with that frame of mind. So if you have to learn economics if you're going to be an economist. And if you're interested in you know, political theory, you're, you want to be a political theorist or a political scientist or a political philosopher or a political commentator for you know, a magazine or something. Not a libertarian theorist. Or you know, My goal is to be an anarcho-capitalist intellectual. I mean, there's a sense in which that might be your goal, but you need to have a discipline. It needs to be history or political science or philosophy. And you have to, if you want to do political philosophy, you have to be a trained philosopher. You have to know something about philosophy and not just read ten articles in anarcho-libertarianism and think that, you, that that's all you need to know. Okay. Um, that, so an implication of that is that you have to know what other people in your discipline are saying. And this is sort of the quintessential question for Austrian economics is, do I have to go to grad school and learn all that stuff that they teach you in grad school that we all hate and think is wrong? I mean, there are different opinions on that, but I think it's a huge handicap if you don't know kind of the current modes of discourse in your field, um, because then you're unable to converse with people in your field who may not agree with you 100% on everything. And um, a lot of what Austrian economists do, um, and what Menger and Bombavik and Mises and Rothbard and so on have always done, is engage in dialogue and controversy and have debates and arguments with economists from other perspectives. Now, the uh, Menger's debate with the German historical school, Mises and the socialist calculation debate, Hayek and Keynes, and so on. So, I mean, if you, have, if you don't even speak the same language as the other people in your profession, it's going to be hard to do anything, hard to um, ex ex explain your views to other people who might not be as familiar with them. Okay. Um, a couple of comments about um, going to grad school. Let me just ask how many people here are, are either in graduate school or are thinking about going to graduate school at some point. Quite a few. Um, so, you know, you, there, there are a couple of broad strategies for, for you know, choosing a graduate school and being successful in graduate school once you're there. Um, so, first of all, where should you go? There are there's sort of two approaches that one could take. One is, you know, you find a university or a program that has somebody you like and you go there. Okay, so, you know, I, I want to study with Hans Hermann Hoppe, so I go to UNLV, that's where I'm going to go. Um, or, or, or whatever. Um, that approach has strengths and weaknesses. Okay, I mean, strength, of course, is that you, you, you get to, you, you have a chance of studying with these people that you really want to study with. Um, there's some issues or weaknesses with that kind of approach, however. First of all, is that as probably all of you know, um, there, there just is no such thing as an Austrian economics department anywhere in the world. 
There just isn't one. Okay, now there are some universities with economics departments that have some Austrians in them, uh, or that have students who are interested in Austrian economics, or more likely, you know, students who are uh, students and professors who are sort of fellow travelers, or, or are, are at least somewhat sympathetic to the Austrian school. But, you know, there are names that you've probably heard bandied about, uh, like George Mason. Okay, George Mason is not an Austrian economics department. There are some faculty members who know something about Austrian economics, and m- m- more likely than not are critical of it, but at least have heard of it. And you can actually take a course or two in Austrian economics. You can do a field in Austrian economics at GMU. But, you know, you're not going to be reading Mises from day one. You're going to be doing all the math and all the econometrics and the exact same, taking the exact same set of core courses that people take at any university uh, uh, around. Okay? Uh, NYU is a place that for years was, has sort of an Austrian reputation. Of course, that's where Mises taught as an adjunct. And Israel Kirzner and Mario Rizzo are both on the faculty there. Kirzner is, is retiring. Um, and they've had other Austrians like uh, um, Jerry O'Driscoll, Larry White, Peter Bedke. Um, but what, the, what that actually means is that NYU had for many years and still has, although it's kind of on its last legs, you know, what, uh, what they call the Austrian program, which involves some scholarships for graduate students, a weekly colloquium, uh, where people would get together and discuss Austrian ideas and so on. But it was part of the regular NYU economics program, and the grad students there took the regular math and econometrics and you know, all the same stuff that everybody else takes. And actually, there was quite a bit of friction there between the people who identified themselves with the Austrian program and those who didn't. Um, if you know Bob Murphy, who's here this week, he's a student in that program, and he'd be a good person to talk to about that. Um, you know, Auburn was a choice for some people for a while because of the institute, uh, but Auburn doesn't have a Ph.D. program anymore. That, that was, um, they recently lost it. Um, you know, UNLV has a master's program, doesn't have a doctoral program. Um, some Austrian interested students have come to my school, University of Georgia, which, again, has some Austrians and some fellow travelers on the, on the faculty, which is pretty good and pretty rare. But, again, we don't, we're not an Austrian program, don't offer an Austrian degree, just offer the standard degree. Um, another thing to keep in mind about the academic marketplace is that, you know, there's a lot, there's a very strict pecking order. Academics is, you know, it, it's like a dog show. I mean, pedigree is everything. Okay, pedigree counts for everything. And there's a, there's a high, rigid hierarchy of schools. You know, Harvard is up here, and, uh, you know, Auburn is down here, and, you know, uh, Opelika State Technical College is down here. Okay, and there are all kinds of schools all in between. But um, where you get a job in academia is, depends a lot on where your degree comes from. Okay, the better the school, the more likely you will be able to, that you can get a decent job. And you can almost never move up the pecking order. You can only move down. Okay, so if you get a PhD from, say, you know, the University of Michigan, let's say that's the 15th ranked program, and it's probably in that ballpark. Um, that means you can only get a job at, you know, programs ranked, say, 20 or 30 and below. Okay, you cannot get a PhD from Michigan and get hired at Michigan or a school as good as Michigan, and you sure as heck can't get a job at a school that's ranked higher than Michigan. Okay, That's fine. It doesn't mean that the prestige of the school where you go is necessarily the most important criteria or even unimportant criteria at all. But you, you should at least be aware that you face that trade-off. And if you go to a school to study with a particular person or persons, if that school is not ranked highly in the pecking order, that means fewer jobs will be available to you uh, when you get your degree and get out. So that's something to think about. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that professors, there's a lot more mobility of professors between schools than is commonly realized. And if you go to school X because you really want to study with Professor Y, you might be shocked to find that once you get there, Professor Y leaves, you know, gets a job at another school or whatever. Um, so that's a, that's a hazard. Okay, a, another strategy. You know, often thinking about these problems and trade-offs, a lot of people in your shoes have chosen another strategy. I um, mean, that other strategy is, you know, look, just try to go to the best school you can get into. You know, you look at the pecking order and you apply to schools in a variety of places of the pecking order. And if you get admitted to the Ph.D. program, you know, let's say at Stanford, then you go. Okay, it doesn't matter who really is on the faculty. You just know that if you get a Ph.D. from Stanford, you're going to have great job opportunities on average. And your chances of getting a job are much, much better than someone who has a Ph.D. from Georgia, from my school. 
Okay, so just go to the best place you can. Um, gives you great, may give you great career opportunities or advantages. On the other hand, it may be really painful to, to, to go there and to be stuck in a place that you hate, you know, without any like-minded students or professors. You may feel totally isolated. It's not so bad now with the web and, you know, being able to keep in touch with the Mises mailing lists and all that sort of thing and being able to come to conferences like this. But still, there's a motivational problem. Um, this also touches on what we mentioned earlier about the this idea of sort of coming out of the closet. Murray Rothbard used to talk about this, and he would say he was critical of the following kind of strategy that he observed many younger colleagues and students pursuing. And that is, you know, okay, I'm going to go, I, I, I'm going to try to get into Stanford. And by, by gosh, on my application to Stanford, I ain't going to mention anything about, you know, Mises or Austrians because that's going to be regarded as kooky. Okay, so I, I'm sort of a stealth Austrian, you know. I get into Stanford and I go through the program and I, I write a mainstream dissertation, you know, don't ruffle any feathers, um, everything's fine, you know, and I'm just doing that just so I can, just so I can get a degree, okay? That's, I, I, that's the only reason I'm doing it. Okay, so I get my degree, then what do I want to do? Well, you know, thinking about the diagram here, well, I've got to get a job and I'm certainly not going to say anything Austrian when I'm in my job interviews because I want to get a job. But, you know, later, once I get... Once I get a job, then I'll be in Austria. Because then you get a job, and, and, and then you want to get tenure, and you say, well, after I get tenure, then I'll be in Austria. You know, you see what, what happens. You, you keep going, and then you get tenure, then you want to be promoted from associate professor to full professor. Then you want to get a, 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 an endowed chair, and then you want to get more prestigious appointments with this and that. And all the time, the Austrian stuff is sort of fading farther and farther into the background. And finally, when you reach that point, you know, where you're going to jump out of the phone booth like Clark Kent... You know, rip open your shirt, and there's the big A, a big red letter A for Austrian. Um, by the time you get to the point where you've achieved all your career goals, and there's no longer any need to hide your true love, it's too late. You know, you're like 60 years old or something, and you know, you've forgotten what it, whatever it was about Austrian economics that interested you years and years ago. Okay, so there's a real danger in pursuing the second strategy, too. Sort of more of a careerist strategy. And the danger is that you may never set out to do what you meant to do, and you'll find yourself old and, and sad and lonely, and you look back on your life and you think, you know, I never accomplished any of those things I eagerly talked about when I attended Mises University back in 2001. Look at me today. I drive a Lexus, but, you know, I'm really unhappy. Okay. Um, okay, so, second point is... Um, uh, before you go to grad school or while you're in grad school, or if you're thinking about grad schools, don't underestimate what you have to know before you go. Okay, so if those of you who are interested in economics and thinking about grad school and economics, I just have, you know, three words for you. Math, math, and math. Okay, you have to know a lot of math, um, and you have to have the right math courses before you go. And we, if you want, we can talk specifically about what those courses are. Sean. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. There are some places that have a specialized Austrian kind of program, and Walsh College is one. But keep in mind, that's, it's an MA program, right? So it's not a doctoral program. So you, you I mean, it, I would certainly encourage anyone who's interested to, to, look, to check it out, and I think it's a very good program. But it's not a substitute for a doctoral program. You would not be able to get a job as a professor um, with just a master's degree nowadays um, at the vast majority of places. See, so, yeah, I shouldn't be too uh, quick to, I don't want to paint a, with too broad a brush here. I mean, there are some places where you can study Austrian stuff more explicitly. And certainly at the undergraduate level, uh, there are a lot of places where there are courses and so on in Austrian economics. But at the level of training where you need to go to get a doctoral degree to be a professor, um, that's, it's much more rare. Okay. Um, anyway, so learn what courses you need to have. And if you need to have a bunch of math courses, take them. Don't, under, don't, un, don't blow that stuff off and say, ah, I, I'm an Austrian, I don't need that. Um, you'll flunk out if you don't have it, basically. Um, although I should say, I don't want to scare, I mean, I do want to scare you a little bit, just for motivational reasons, but the math is really not that hard. It's just tedious. It's not like advanced math. Like mathematicians look at mathematical economists and they just laugh. They think that they're a total joke. Um, but, but, it is, but it is, you know, if you don't have a knack for that or if it's been years since you did it or whatever, you really do need to brush up. Um, okay, just a few miscellaneous things and then I'll, then I'll stop talking. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of problems associated with the economics profession. But 
some people argue that it, it's possible to do good work in economics without actually being an economics professor or a, or a professional economist, but rather you might want to be a teacher at a law school or even a professor in another field in political science or something. I mean, you know, look what the Marxists did. Right? There are very few Marxist economists anymore, thankfully, um, uh, in, in academia, but there are you know, Marxists everywhere in law schools and English departments and political de- science departments, philosophy departments, and the Marxists had a pretty clever strategy. They realized that they weren't getting anywhere in the economics profession, um, but they, they sort of co-opted other fields. And so they're doing Marxist kind of stuff without actually having to you know, survive in the economics profession where they would find it very difficult. And some young students of Austrian economics have chosen to, 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 try, to go into these other fields, figuring that you know, I can do what's basically Austrian economics without actually being in that box of being you know, an economist. Um, and and uh, some people have been very successful doing that. And of course, a lot of the scholars that you meet at our conferences um, and that publish in our journals and so on, um, even though they're doing very good work in economics, they may not technically be in the economics profession. They may be in one of these companion disciplines. That's something to think about. Um, I, I have some specific suggestions about choosing dissertation topics, trying to get them published and all that, but uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A period if people um, are interested. Um, but just, you know, as a general sense, you want, in a general sense, you want to think about writing dissertations and publishing articles that will be appealing to somebody. Okay, so you need to, to, to know what kind of, what are considered interesting topics in your profession, not just within this, you know, room or within this building, but outside this building as well, and try to find things that are interesting to people who may not necessarily share your, the same philosophical foundations uh, as you. And I think that's one problem that Austrian economists have typically had, especially in the modern era, is that they, they think too much about Austrian economics as a self-contained thing and not enough about economics or the economy more broadly. But I'll close with this sort of comment. Um, my own personal view about you know, how, how, should, how will Austrian economics, how, how can it be advanced and how can we take over the profession? How can we convince people to take Austrians seriously and all that? My own view is not that, that we're not going to do that by writing a bunch of articles on why neoclassical economics is wrong, why po- the positivist method is flawed, and a bunch of articles why, uh, uh, on praxeology. Not that those articles, all of those articles shouldn't be written. I think they should be written. They're valuable and important. But I don't think that's likely to convince very many people. Because most economists, let alone people in these other disciplines we're talking about, you know, just ain't that philosophical. Right? I mean, some of us have this idea that, well, here's, you know, Joe Economist over here. And, you know, he's a neoclassical positivist interventionist, you know, SOB or whatever. Because he deeply believes in his heart that that's the right way to do economics. You know, he read Samuelson's Foundations, the Foundations of Economic Analysis. And he read Friedman's, you know, essays on uh, um, positivism. And he seriously, he, he con- self, you know, he's very self-conscious about his methodology. And he does economics because he believes it. It's just not true. Joe Economist has never even given a moment's thought to these deeper philosophical and methodological issues. He does economics the way he does it. Because that's the way he learned it. It was, it was taught to him that way in grad school. He's never seen it done another way. He's never heard of it done another way. He just, he's just doing it. I mean... A lot of economists are like mechanics. You know, they're just sort of doing their little thing, and they don't really think about these big picture topics, these big picture issues. Um, so, you know, bashing these people over the head by talking about methodology, it, it's like a foreign language to them. Right now, the kind of thing that professionals, professional economists and academics do respond to is, you know, interesting theories and evidence that bear on some phenomenon or issue that they think is important. Okay, so I think it's useful to think about, you know, think about the real world. Think about real world issues, policy issues or, or uh, issues about some area of the economy. You know, if, if you're interested in, um, like in my field, for example, if you're interested in uh, uh, the organization of industry and how, how companies work from an Austrian perspective, well, the way to get people to be interested in what you're saying is to think of some real issue. Like I'll pick on Alex because I like to pick on him. He's sitting there in the back. You know, he's doing this dissertation on insider trading. Now, insider trading is a, 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 an applied topic that a lot of people think is important. Okay, and so even somebody who has never heard the first thing about Austrian economics 
uh, but knows something about corporations and securities laws and maybe is interested in so-called agency problems, the theory of the firm, and, and, and insider training uh, specifically, would want to read his stuff. Okay? And, and if, if you can show these other guys that by using the Austrian approach, you can say something about, for example, insider trading that's interesting, that's important, that they hadn't thought of before, that illuminates that phenomenon in a new and important way, they will listen to you. Okay? So that's the way to get people to listen to you, is to show them that you have something interesting and important to say about some topic that they care about. And I think that's something that everybody should try to keep in mind. Okay. What are some issues and topics that you guys would like to hear more about or share your own experiences or ask other, see if other people have experiences that would benefit you? Um, looking at grad schools, I noticed a lot of, like, they offer specializations in PhDs. You know, like, um, University of Colorado has this huge list, like six or seven topics right. that Georgia offers to it. Right. And I really don't know what the different specializations are or what the function of them. Should I be looking at certain schools? And okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, so the question is, do I want to, should I know at this point that I want to specialize in, say, you know, international trade theory and go to a place that is really strong in international trade? Again, I mean, there, there are trade-offs. Um, if, you, if you know what, if you already know very specifically what you want to do, then sure, there's, there's good reason to, to find places that have a strength in that area. But... <coughs> Most schools offer a general, they offer the same general core, which will prepare you equally well for doing really any of these specialties. And most of the decent, you know, the top 30, 40 schools all offer basically the same set of fields with a few exceptions. Well, one exception might be, you know, public choice. If you're really interested in so-called public choice, not every school offers that. Only, only some do. But if you're interested in, you know, macro and business cycles or international trade or industrial organization or labor economics or economic development, uh, something like that, almost any school will offer fields in that area. And again, it, it depends on you. It depends whether you know what you want to do or not. A lot of people go to grad school. It's like, I know I'm vaguely interested in economics, but I don't really have a, a field in mind. I certainly don't have a, a dissertation topic in mind. Um, so you go and you spend the first couple of years thinking about it and exploring and learning more, and then you decide later. So one, one hazard of going to a place that has a very strong specialty, perhaps in the neglect of, to the neglect of other fields, is that you go there and decide you really don't like that specialty after all, and, th and then you're kind of stuck. But at least that's the way it is in the U.S. Now, s some of you are, are, are from Europe. Uh, in the European system, by the time you enter a Ph.D. program, basically all you do is write a dissertation. You don't take classes. So you have to have a dissertation topic before you can even apply to grad schools. It's not like that in the U.S. Um, you go and you take courses for the first two, two and a half years, just like everybody else, and you don't really have to have a specialization just yet. When you talk about the, like, ranking the colleges, are you talking about like U.S. News, you know, whatever ranking? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the, those U.S. News things are usually... Um, sometimes they have them specifically by well, discipline. Yeah, yeah, what I mean, but, like, yeah like, exactly. There are other, there, you can get a rank... They're, they're, they don't all agree, but there are various rankings of graduate programs in economics. There's some variation, but I mean, usually within cat, you know, the top 20 are pretty much the top 20, and the next 20 are pretty much the next 20 in any survey. But yeah, that's the kind of thing I have in mind. How important is the uh, reputation of your undergraduate school to get into a top graduate? In my experience, it counts almost zero. Really? It really doesn't matter. That's one of the biggest surprises to me, and going to grad school and learning about the graduate school admission process is that research, and this applies to research universities that have PhD programs, when they look at applications, basically they look at one thing and one thing only, and that one thing is math GRE score. Okay? They don't care if you've ever taken an economics course in your life. They don't care what your GPA was. You know, some of them make you write an essay, you know, why I want to go to graduate school, whatever. Don't spend even five minutes on it because no one will read it. All they look at is the math GRE score. I mean, I'm being a little bit, I'm exaggerating a, a little bit, but, but that really is the main thing that people look at. Um, the prestige of the undergraduate school doesn't really matter. And I, I'm really, I'm not kidding when I say that being an economics major usually doesn't help you. It doesn't matter. Because they figure, you know, you sort of have to relearn it all anyway because the, the kind of economics you learn, even in a very good undergraduate program, is different from what you learn in a 
graduate program, you know, because the graduate program was all math, right? And so it's sort of like if you, if you, I personally found it useful that I had already had economics course, course, and I was an economics major, but it's like, but it's, it's, it's really like just learning a whole new way of sort of saying the same thing. Um, maybe it's even a hindrance because I'm trying to think of it in terms of you know demand curves, you know, and there, instead of just looking at a bunch of equations. Um, I, I once asked a professor of mine in grad school. We were talking about um, grad students teaching, which grad students often do, you know, to make money. And uh, so they would assign grad students to be teaching assistants in, in classes, and sometimes to teach their own classes. And I once asked him. Um, I said, "Why is it that we always assign people when it's their very first time teaching?" to teach, you know, the intro freshman principles of economics course. So, you know, because if you think about it, um, teaching intro econ is not necessarily the easiest thing to teach. If you're just starting out as a teacher, and you haven't really learned the best ways to explain things to people. You know, it's probably easier to teach something like, you know, intermediate micro theory, where you can use a little bit of math and diagrams, and you can sort of more talk about it the way that you yourself are currently studying it as a grad student. Really, it's a challenge. It takes some pedagogical skill to teach an intro class. I said, so why do we do this? And he said, oh, well, you know, the reason we assign our first-year TAs or second-year TAs to teach intro classes is so they'll learn some intro economics. Because, <laughs> you know, they were, all, they were physics majors and chemistry majors, math majors, engineering majors. Most of them were not economics majors. They'd never seen an economics course before. So this was a chance. It let them teach Econ 1, whatever they call it at your school, and then, oh, no, so that's what a demand curve is. Oh, yeah. Sad but true. Right. Okay. So the question is exactly what, how much math you have to have, or what math courses, or whatever. I mean, certainly there's some variation from school to school. So the most important thing is, whatever schools you're interested in, you just need to ask, see if it's on their application. Usually they'll tell you you ought to have the following, and almost always the the, the minimum requirements would include, you know, at least a full year of calculus through multiple variable calculus, um, one course in linear algebra for the statistics or econometrics class, possibly a course in some stat courses, like mathematical statistics. Um, sometimes they recommend um, like uh, um, courses in differential equations, which can be useful in, in macro. But the bare minimum, multivariable calculus, some stat background, and typically linear algebra. And that's like the minimum. Again, it depends on you. You know, If you're one of those people who has a knack for math, you're probably fine with just those. If, if math is not as intuitive to you, you might want to take above and beyond, you know, you might want to go above and beyond in your undergraduate days or, you know, the summer before you start grad school. You could take some courses at the local college, maybe even more courses just to get more familiar with it. But um, that's, that's a question to ask at the schools you're considering. And by the way, one a great, if, if you're considering certain graduate schools, it's perfectly fair to ask, you know, if you go for a visit or you call and talk to the admissions people. Say, I would like to talk with some of your current grad students. You can go meet with them or email them or talk to them on the phone or whatever. And you can just ask them. Say, okay, you're, you're in your second year of grad school there. What was it like the first year? And what do you wish you'd done? What courses do you wish you had taken that you didn't take or whatever? How much math is there in like, the MBA program? Oh, uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, MBA programs are, are, are typically very different. Um, they're much more applied, much more practical, and much more interdisciplinary. Like most MBA programs, you know, you can have a field, you can have fields of specialty, but it's more of a general business degree. So, you know, you're going to take courses in some economics courses, and you also take courses in accounting and finance, man, strategic management, human resource management, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, an MBA is just a different kind of degree. That's the, that's the degree you want if you want to be a practicing manager. Or if you want to be, learn, well, I was going to say if you want to be an entrepreneur, but there's really not much you learn in MBA programs uh, that teaches you how to be an entrepreneur. But it's a, use, it's a general business degree, more, slightly more advanced than undergraduate level business degrees. And, you know, some, some, some people are a little bit cynical about some of the elements of MBA group programs. And between you and me, you know, there's a lot of touchy-feely you know, stuff. Let's all get around in a big circle and hold hands and, and hug and you know, these things where, you know, what you, some, I stand behind you and then you have to fall down and I have to catch you. You know, this sort of team-building stuff that they do on corporate retreats, which is really just complete 
a complete waste of time. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of that in MBA programs. But so, and it, most MBA degrees are less technical and they don't have the same math requirements um, unless you do maybe like a finance, if you do a, a track in finance, microfinance or something, you, it might be more mathy. But again, that kind of degree is, is suitable if you want to be in business. Um, it's not going to help you as much if you want to be a teacher. Go ahead. Does it matter as much as if you're like an Austrian economist or anything like that? Well, again, typically the level of economic analysis that you get in those programs is, you know, again, is maybe one or two courses. So I don't think I think it would neither help you specifically nor hinder you either way, um, because you know the kind of projects that you do in MBA programs. It's not like writing a master's thesis or a PhD dissertation where you're using economic theory to explain X, Y, Z. You know, you'd be doing like case studies of companies, and you know, I think Austrian economics is going to be very valuable for doing that. But um, I don't, I don't think that's that wouldn't be the biggest thing in determining how successful or satisfied you are with your MBA program. Having an MBA, I agree. And if you want to go to you know, an MBA program, you have to want to do group work. And that can be very difficult. But it's group work in every single class, except sure. for maybe a couple. Right. And you typically will have some slackers. You'll have groups of four. You'll have two people who really want to work hard and two that are on your coattails. Yeah. And, and then uh, they get the A um, you know, on right. your back. And a lot of it is touchy-feely, but I really do believe and why I'm here is because I found that I'm throwing out some bad knowledge and learning some good stuff here. If you have an Austrian background in an MBA program, you'll have a better tool chest with which to mm -hmm. you know, analyze yep. these case studies and make it more robust when you write your paper. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. No question. And, and there's some very good you know, practicing professional financial analysts and you know, people that you've probably read about on, on the Mises webpage, you know, Frank Shostak and, and uh, guys like James Grant, who are basically Austrians, Gene Epstein, who writes for Barron's, who use the, uh, an Austrian framework to better understand, you know, what real-world financial markets are doing and corporate performance and so on. So absolutely, I think Austrian economics is valuable um, in that line of work. And if, if that's what you want to do, then the same sort of general framework for thinking about your career that we're talking about here would also apply. Other, yeah. In regard to being a TA, like, what, what's the experience? What did you know before that? Again, it, it's not something that I would really worry about. Yeah. Most of us, because we're good guys and because we want to make a difference, you know, most of us here and in, 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 within these walls, you know, take our teaching responsibilities seriously. But at most universities, they don't. <laughs> and, um, you know, no, your performance as a TA has absolutely no bearing at all on your ability to get your degree and be successful in a research environment. Um, I mean, not to be not to sound too cynical about it, but it's really true. I mean, you know, deans and college presidents give all these speeches where they say, "Oh, we value teaching, and we want the undergraduate experience to be great." It's all lies. <laughs> I mean, it's, they say that to please uh, the board of regents and the. And, and people who make contributions to the university, but basically all they care about is research. And you know, unless you're just a complete disaster in the classroom, you're not going to lose that job. Is it hard to be a TA? Or? Well, I think it varies from person to person. Um, I personally think it is a little bit hard to do it really well. I mean, apply it to like, you know, like if you're applying to be a TA, it's a hard to. Oh, oh, no, no. I mean, you, you you're a TA whether you want to be or not. Um, that's how you. <laughs> That's how you, you know, if you get financial aid from the university or stipend, that's what you do. I mean, at, at my school, they alternate, but, you know, one semester they'll assign you to be a, a TA, one semester they'll assign you to be a research assistant to a professor, which, you know, can mean anything from, you know, really being a co-researcher with the professor to, you know, making Xerox copies for him at the library. Um, but, yeah, th that's just part of the package. Um, I mean, but, but now I should say that um, a lot of what we've been talking about today is really geared more towards research universities and, you know, trying to get a job at a research university. Now, if your goal down here is to get a job at a good liberal arts college, you know, to, 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 be, a, to be a teacher, your goal is to get a job, you know, like at Grove City College or Hillsdale College or something like that, where you can really teach Austrian economics. You can, if you have a passion for teaching and working with young people and so on, that's great. I mean, you can still do research at those universities. But, again, the difference, 
you're handicapped somewhat in your ability to, to write uh, and publish when you're in, the, in that kind of environment because typically the teaching load is much higher. So at most research universities, like at the University of Georgia, professors normally teach four courses per year, two in the, you know, two in the fall semester, two in the spring semester, and often it'll be two sections of the same course. Um, at a good liberal arts college, the standard teaching load would be six courses a year or even eight courses a year, sometimes even more. And it's just hard, you know, th- that takes up a lot of your time, and it's hard to write articles for the Quarterly Journal of Washington Economics or the uh, Journal of Libertarian Studies or whatever, or, or, you know, Reason Magazine or the Cato Journal or whatever, your th- whatever might be your thing. If you're teaching eight classes, you just don't have time to do much else. Um, however, um, that is a, ver- a perfectly viable and, and in many cases very desirable career option. And a lot of you might say, I don't want to do, deal with this whole research and you know, publish or perish. Um, and most of the all, 99% of the research that, that gets done is useless anyway. I don't want to play that cynical game. I want to go and make a difference and I want to teach Austrian economics or whatever you want to teach. Um, and that's great. Um, but there are, again, you know, you want to go through the same process. Now, it, what made me think of that is if you were applying for those kinds of jobs, you know, with your doctoral degree in hand or about to be in hand, then your performance as a, as a TA would, might really count for something. In fact, some, when you apply for a job at some of these good liberal arts colleges, you know, they want to see, you know, yeah, what did you write? What's your, they want to know about your dissertation and they want to know about your, maybe the grades in your courses, but they really want to know about your teaching experiences and, and you have to have teaching evaluations from students that you taught. Um, and, you know, maybe a written statement, your philosophy of teaching and examples of a syllabus from a course that you taught or whatever. When you apply for jobs at research universities, they don't care about any of that. They just want to know what you, what you write your dissertation on. Who's your advisor? Is it somebody famous they've heard of? You know, do you have good letters of recommendation from other professors? They don't really care about your teaching experiences. But on the market for liberal arts jobs, uh, art college jobs, and they really do. So then you'd want to take it very seriously. Right. Well, okay. Um, besides teaching, I mean, again, there's research broadly construed, which could be anything from being a professor at a research university to working at a think tank, you know, being a, a senior fellow or a visiting fellow at the Mises Institute, or you're a full-time researcher. And there are also other sort of policy think tank type places, you know, Cato and Heritage and AEI and the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the Independent Institute. These are all sort of, you know, Somewhat market oriented or, uh. Do they look for academics though? You know, academics look like yourself, someone who's teaching? It, yeah, it, it depends. I mean, if you look at the output, you know, just randomly take, say, the Heritage Foundation. And they publish a lot of these little policy papers. Some of them are written by professors. I mean, some of the people at this conference who are full time professors at universities kind of do that on the side. Uh-huh. But they also have full time staffers. I mean, sometimes people with just undergraduate degrees, sometimes people with master's degrees, sometimes people with um, uh, even PhDs who work full-time for that organization and write these pol- do policy analysis and, and run seminars and sorts of things like that. Um, so those are things that you can do with an economics degree. Um, again, if, it's, if you have a PhD in economics, most people either try to get a job at a university or a college or you know, a private sector consulting type firm or, in many cases, a government organization. Um, what about, like, a corporate Yeah. Like a larger corporation. Are there many? Yeah. Oh, um, actually, there are fewer now than there were maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Um, companies have cut back their in-house economics uh-huh. research departments because maybe because they found out that they're not adding as much value to the company as was thought. But also, it's just cheaper to contract out for that stuff. Yeah, you, con- yeah you just go to a professor. Yeah, pro- I mean, a lot of professors, one way that, yeah, one way that, that you know, low-pay, underpaid professors supplement their income is by doing a lot of consulting for these companies. But, but at the same time, there are companies that hire economists um, to do, an, you know, market analysis. I, I mean, I can give you th- some names of some people that you could talk to, for example, um, uh, Robert Beta Marco, who has often been a faculty member at Mises University, um, has a, some background in, he's a you know, PhD economist um, who does uh, research on business cycles and things like that. But he also works, he has worked part-time and even full-time for a kind of a market research firm 
using his expertise in analyzing markets for marketing purposes. They're financial economists like, like Frank Shostak. Um, one good way, a, a general way to answer that question without being specific is um, there's a publication called Job Openings for Economists. Um, and you can get it on the web now. It comes out every month. I forget the exact web address, but if you can't find it, just send me an email and I'll, I'll find it for you. Um, I think I have it on my own personal web page. I have a link to it. Um, but this is a, it's, it's just job listings um, for people with PhDs in economics. And there's, it's divided into sections. The first is academic, and the second is, I think, is, I forget what they call it, non-academic or government slash corporate. And you can look, there are lists of um, institutions that are looking to hire people with, with graduate degrees in economics, um, strategy consulting firms, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, uh, a, a colleague of mine uh, at the University of Georgia with a, with a PhD from Stanford, a very bright guy, um, left the university and took a, ch- took a job with Deloitte and Touche uh, doing analysis of intra-company transfer pricing. And he's making, you know, three times as much money as, as I do um, and enjoying it very much. So, yeah, absolutely, there are job opportunities in the private sector for doing that kind of thing. I mean, again, typically that's more applied work. You know, remember, when you're in the real world, your employers expect you, expect you actually to produce things that will be valuable to them. So it's not like, you know, diddling around, eh, praxeology, this and that. You know, you've got you to produce. Your research is typically much more applied, and it's more driven by the goals of the company. Um, so, you know, one of the great things about being an academic is, you know, it, it sounds like a cliche, but it's really true that, you know, you do have a lot of freedom in one sense. It's not academic freedom like the people talk about on TV because, you know, there are certain things you can't say or, or you'll get in trouble. But, you know, you, you choose what topics you want to write about and research about. No one's directing you and telling you what you have to study. You don't have pressure to publish, you know, on a certain yeah. subject and not on Well, you do have pressure to publish some certain kinds of publications, but it's not so much by subject, it's sort of, it's the prestige of the place where you publish. So, yeah, just as there's a hierarchy of schools, there's a hierarchy of journals and book publishers. And so, you know, you can, to get tenure, you have to have a certain number of publications, and they can't just be in any journals. They have to be in the top-ranked journals in some field or another. All that sounds like there's much pressure of being under corporate umbrella. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, type of pressure. yeah, it may be. That, I think that's a good point. So, yeah, again, I would encourage you to, 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 to get in touch with people who are working in those kind of jobs and find out what the environment's like. But, yeah, there's certainly opportunities to do that. Okay. If you don't have an economics background, um, not much of a background, mm-hmm. would, before you go to grad school, is it good to pick up a macro or a micro book from a bookstore and just kind of scan through the stuff so you're yeah. not jumping right. into Again, my answer would be, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt, and it probably is useful before you start, you know, to kind of brush up on some things that you think might be valuable. But again, I, I can't emphasize this too much. If you go to a, a, you know, a PhD program in economics at, say, one of the top 30 schools, you know, the first day of class, you're going to be bombarded with a bunch of stuff that you won't find in the textbooks that you studied the past summer. And... You know, some of that stuff, it may be helpful and it's useful, I think, to step back from the rigors of the day-to-day boring math stuff to, to, you know, remind yourself, why am I here and why am I going through this torture? You know, what is it I really love about economics and what do I want to achieve and so on? But on a day-to-day basis, I, it probably won't help that much. Um, again, it might be good to make you more relaxed and more confident and feel more comfortable. It might be fun. It might be valuable in the long run. But, I mean, I remember my first, I mean, it, it's true, the first year of grad school, it, it's like hazing in a fraternity, <laughs> okay? I mean, it really is pretty awful. But, you know, you, you, you just try to survive it, and then it gets better the next year, and it gets better after that. And I mean, I hope I don't sound really, you know, cynical up here, because, I mean, I love what I do, and I can't imagine doing anything else. But, but grad school, it, it, it's hard, and... It, I found many parts of it unpleasant. But, you know, if you survive, you really bond with your classmates, and it really is like hazing. Maybe it's like being in the Marines or something. You know, by the time you survive, you're really battle-scarred and you're ready to go. Um, but so, again, I would say do those things if you can, but it's not essential. Yes? What about the prospects for an economic historian? Uh, they're great prospects. Um, you know, there, at any point in time, there are certain fields of specialization that are 
more hot or less hot. And I would say economic history is not the hottest of, of topics, but there's still a huge market for economic historians. Great person to talk about, uh, talk to that about is, is Rich Vetter, who's an economic historian at Ohio University, you know, and of course one of our faculty members. Um, uh, you can get a PhD doing good work in economic history, which of course, you remember to, to an Austrian, you know, almost any empirical work or empirical work by definition is economic history, right? Now, in the, when you call yourself an economic historian in the, you know, in the economics profession, it usually means you're studying stuff that's at least, you know, 50 years old. Now, we would say that even if you're looking at data from last week, you're doing economic history in Mises' sense, as opposed to economic theory. But yes, if you're interested in, you know, the economics of the Industrial Revolution or World War II or what, whatever, then... Yes, you can get a PhD in that at almost any of the major universities, and you can certainly get a good job doing that. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's a really valuable area for Austrians to get into. I mean, look at look at Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression. I mean, that's a fantastic work of of economic history, and one of the best ways of trying to introduce people to the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Right, Rothbard. You know, if you look at that book, the he has an introductory section that's pure theory that just summarizes the Austrian theory of the business cycle. But his purpose in putting it there is not just to try to convince theorists that this is the correct theory, but to use it to understand reality, to explain an event that actually happened. And that's a great way to help to convince non-Austrians, I think, that Austrian economics is valuable. Say, so, look, we can explain and understand this historical episode better than you can. It's because we have the correct theory underlying our analysis. It's a great field to be in. Uh, Robert Higgs is another good guy to talk to who has used Austrian insights in his work in uh, economic history. Mark Thornton has done a lot of good work in economic history from an Austrian perspective. Now, I've done some research on what might be considered very modern history by some, you know, the 1950s and 1960s and 70s. Um, I don't normally think of myself as an economic historian, but I've done some applied empirical work trying to understand, you know, what corporations were doing in the 60s and 70s using, using theory that's, that's consistent with, you know, Misesian principles. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Oh, I guess we're, on, oh, I guess we're done. Are we out of time? Okay. I didn't realize. Okay, well, thank you for coming.